Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan, and I'd like to welcome you to the Discover NASA's Fire Information for Resource Management System webinar. While everybody's logging in, you've probably noticed that we have two optional polls. You'll find those located at the bottom left and also middle portion of your page. And I'd like to thank you in advance for your feedback on these polls. I've got 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, so we are going to go ahead and get started here. What I'd like to do first is just review a few logistics related to this webinar. To ensure the best audio experience, the conference has been placed in silent mode. However, if you have any issues or you have any questions, what I'd like for you to do is enter those into the Q&A pod, and you should see that located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. This works like a chat. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted both to our online Adobe Connect webinar catalog as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a couple of days of completion. I'll send an email to all registrants with links to the recording. In addition, today's presentation files will be available for download at the end of the webinar. As far as timing is concerned, today's webinar will be one hour long. We've allocated 45 minutes to the presentation uh, and also live demonstration with an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. So once our speaker has finished her presentation and demo today, what we'll do then is we'll transition to an optional final set of polling questions. And I usually give these about uh, two to three minutes or so. And then from there, we'll move directly to the Q&A period. And then just one final note, depending upon the volume of questions that are received, we will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes to 3.15 p.m. Eastern Time for those of you who may wish to stay on the line. What I'd like to do next is pull up today's agenda for all of you here. It should take just a second. I'll pull that up. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, today we'll spend the first 10 minutes or so with some introductory information regarding the NASA firm's project. And then from here, our speaker will provide an overview to our VIRS and MODIS active fire and hotspot data products. And then after this, what she'll do is transition to a live demonstration of firms as well as the, uh, the NASA Worldview tool, and she'll walk you through the key services that are, that are available through firms, such as the Fire Mapper, and also how to set up an email alert for fire hotspot activity within your region of interest. Um, again, she will show you a quick tour of the NASA Worldview application, which is another way to visualize or access the fire data. And then finally, to wrap up today's webinar, we will briefly discuss some of the caveats that should be considered and using these NASA FHIR data products. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Diane Davies, who is the NASA Land Atmosphere Near Real-Time Capability for EOS, or LANCE, Operations Manager. Diane? Thank you very much, Jennifer. Can you hear me OK? All right. Yes, I can so, hear you. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so it's my pleasure to be doing this webinar on firms today. Um, FIRMS, or the Fire Information for Resource Management, has been operating for over 10 years now. And um, as we recently updated the system, this webinar is very timely. I'll be able to give you an overview of FIRMS, as well as highlight some of the new features. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to say that we are always interested to hear how the data from FIRMS are being used. And if you have suggestions on how we might improve FIRMS, then please get in touch and let us know, um, either through the support tool or by email. I can't promise that we will implement all the suggestions, but we certainly have a look at them all and uh, we'll consider them. So um, moving on, Jennifer has um, gone through the agenda. So I'll move straight on to the first slide. Um, I thought I'd start by looking at some active fires that are currently burning in the Northern Territories of Australia. So here you can see the active fires, they're in red. These are active fires um, derived from the VIRS satellite. So each one of these little hotspots, um, red pixels, is 375 meters. And these are overlain on a VIRS corrected reflectance true image. And I'll get into the acronyms um, as we go through. 
But um, if each one of these pixels is 375 meters, you can see that this is um, a large fire front. If I just get the pointer here, you can see that um, we have a large fire front here, and you can see the smoke coming off these fires. So um, unfortunately, fires like images like this are not uncommon in the media. In recent months, we've seen huge wildfires sweep through California, Portugal, South Africa, Greece. Um, and this iconic photo here um, shows what some of these fires can look like from the ground. So this is a wildland fire, and this picture was taken in Montana back in 2000. And it's significant because the fires occurred not long after the MODIS instrument was launched on the Terra satellite. And um, the US Forest Service asked NASA if they could provide imagery and data from the MODIS, MODIS instrument for strategic fire management. At the time, it was taking approximately seven days to get MODIS data processed. So a team of um, scientists from University of Maryland, NASA, Goddard Space Flight Center, and um, US Forest Service handcrafted some imagery um, and made it available for strategic fire management. This information proved, proved to be very useful and led to the development of the rapid response system. Initially, the rapid response system was just for North America, but it soon expanded to global coverage. And I included this slide to show some of the georeferenced subsets that have been available through the rapid response system. And I wanted to show this because if any of you are using rapid response still, it is being decommissioned. It has been replaced by Worldview, which I'll demonstrate at the end of this presentation. And um, we have a new low bandwidth version coming out um, to replace the actual subset, and that will be known as Worldview Snapshots. And that, that should be available in the fall of 2018. So firms really built on the work of Rapid Response. Rapid Response was able to provide imagery and um, overlay on that the, um, the fire information as, as red points. But really, what we wanted to do is get the coordinates to users. So the goal of firms was to get the near real-time active fire data into the hands of users in easy-to-use formats. If you're a protected area manager, you need the coordinates of the fire so you can go out and see what's happening, or you want to plot it on a map. So firms was developed by the University of Maryland in 2005 with funds from NASA's Applied Sciences Program, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, and Conservation International. And at this point, I want to acknowledge all my colleagues from NASA and University of Maryland who have worked on firms over the years, um, because without them, uh, none of this would have happened. So firms is now part of LANCE. As uh, Jennifer said, LANCE stands for the Land Atmosphere Near Real-Time Capability for EOS. And this is NASA's capability to provide global near real-time data products within three hours of observation to meet the timely needs of applications users. LANCE provides near real-time data and imagery from 10 instruments now, um, much quicker than routine processing allows. I'm not going to describe LANCE any further, but the URL is there if you are interested and want to take a look. But what I did want to say is that LANCE is a virtual, um, is a virtual system, so it leverages the existing NASA data centers, SIPs, or Science Investigator Processing Systems, and science, um, science computing facilities. And um, the firm system is now part of the MODAT lab SIP, which processes MODIS and VIA's um, data for, for land. OK, this slide um, gives you an overview of firms. And really, the takeaway messages from this are that um, the MODIS data and VIA's data, so MODIS uh, are expedited in terms of their download. So here we are, we have MODIS on board the Terra satellite and again on board Aqua. Um, and the VIA's data is on the SOMI MPP data. So the data processing is expedited, processed here by the land MODIS near real-time processing facility. Um, the um, <coughs> fire points are extracted and made available in the firm services which is the fire map, the active fire data downloads, the fire alerts, the web services, and the archive download tool, all of which I will go through in a moment. But what I did want to say is that we also process the standard data. So the modus, vias, and standard processing also done by the 
um, MODAP, um, also done by MODAP, is made available to the University of Maryland um, Science Computing Facility where it is quality checked and the standard data as text files is provided in the archive download tool. And you'll hear me talking quite a bit about the difference, about the near real time and standard data. I will go over the differences between them, but I just wanted to make it clear that we have these two data sources coming in. Um, in terms of uses, um, we know that people use firms for strategic firms, data provided by firms for strategic fire management, for disaster management, ecological monitoring, prioritizing resources, and um, even for identifying poaching activities. I added this slide because I thought if you're not very familiar with the, um, the different types of satellite, then this might be quite useful. So Terra, Aqua, and SMPP are all polar orbiting satellites. And by that, I mean they move around the Earth from pole to pole as they're orbiting the Earth. As they're orbiting, the Earth turns underneath it, allowing complete coverage of the Earth. These are also sun synchronous orbits, which means the satellites passes overhead at essentially the same solar time throughout all seasons of the year. This enables regular data collection as well as long-term comparison. Okay, um, so these are the three data sources as I've already explained. And the, one, the things that I wanted to kind of point out here are that um, MODIS is on two satellites, the Terra, which is also known as EOS-AM. Um, it crosses the equator at um, 10.30 in the morning, sorry, I'm just getting my pointer here, at 10.30 in the morning and again at 10.30 at night. The um, Aqua satellite um, crosses the equator at 1.30 in the afternoon and again at 1.30 a.m. And VIRS, SMPP, has the same overpass time as Aqua, so again, 1.30 in the afternoon and um, 1.30 a.m. The other thing to note here is that the temporal coverage for these um, instruments varies. Um, we've been getting active fire data for MODIS Terra from the 1st of November 2000, from MODIS Aqua for, from the 3rd of July 2002, and for VIRS only from the 20th of January 2012. And one final thing is that the um, hotspots for MODIS are represented by a one kilometer pixel. The actual pixel size will vary according to the scan and um, track, um, which you will see in the attribute data, which we can cover afterwards. And um, the um, FIERS data is a 375 meter pixel. And you can see the difference between these pixel sizes very clearly in this slide here, which was provided by Wilfred Schroeder from NOAA, um, formerly at the University of Maryland. So this slide shows a fire that was mapped over five days in the Tame Ecological Reserve in southern Brazil. What you see here are the different Julian days um, in different colors. So on the left-hand side, grab the pointer. I'm having to have trouble with this pointer at the moment. Okay, let me try again. All right, no, okay. On the left-hand side, you've got an aqua, thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> you've got an aqua modus um, image, and here you've got one kilometer pixels. And you can see it's very difficult to kind of see where the, how the fire front develops. On the right-hand side, we've got the veers, three, seven, five meter pixels, one over on the very right hand side, thank you. Um, and here you can see how the fire progressed. So the purple is the first day, um, the dark red is the last day. And so you can see very clearly how the fire front developed. So having this additional finer spatial resolution from VIRS is very useful for strategic fire management. The image in the middle is a VIRS 750 meter um, product. We don't make this available in firms because it doesn't really add much, it doesn't really add anything to the VIRS 375 meter product. However, it is available from the LP DAC if that's something that you're interested in. Okay, fire detections. So the fire detections use a contextual algorithm um, that exploits the strong emission, uh, emission of mid-infrared radiation from fires. And I'm not going to go into the algorithm here if you're interested to find out more, there are referee papers, and you can find those at um, this link here. Um, I did want to say that the PI, the principal investigator for the MODIS algorithm, is Louis Giglio from University of Maryland, and the principal investigator for the VIRS active data is Wilfred Schroeder, um, who's at NOAA, formerly University of Maryland. Um, in the past, we found that um, some users get a bit confused about what a MODIS fire detection means on the ground. 
So uh, my colleague Mani put this um, schematic together um, to give a better idea. So on the top here, we have um, the ground observation. Um, so if we have one active fire and it's detected in one pixel, notice pixel, it will appear on the image as one pixel. On the other hand, you may have two smaller fires which are detected within the same one kilometer pixel, but that, that would still show up in the output display as one pixel. Um, and if you have a situation where you have one large fire that's perhaps particularly hot and it saturates, it touches four pixels, then it will show up as four pixels rather than just one, or in this case two, because you've got two fires, a large one and a small one. So I just wanted to make that um, distinction. Obviously, with um, MODIS, you have a one kilometer pixel. And with VIRS, it's different because you've got a 375 meter um, spatial resolution. OK, so moving on to the firm's landing pages, I've explained that um, firms is part of LANCE. As a result of that, we have two landing pages for firms, which can be a little bit um, confusing. But um, please rest assured that no matter which one you go to, you will still end up getting the same data. They link between the two. So the first one, the earthdata.nasa.gov forward slash firms, is, the, is underneath the Lance umbrella. All of the Lance pages have um, landing pages on Earth data. And this contains things like information about the product, the frequently asked questions, support and mailing list, that kind of thing. And on the MODAP pages, we have the actual services, such as FireMap, Active Fire Data, and the alerts. But the two um, websites, uh, they link between each other. So you don't need to worry which one you go to. You will always be pointed to the same, uh, to the same data and uh, to the same information. OK, and I'm going to go through those services now. Um, I'm going to talk about um, Active Fire Data, Web Services, the Fire Alerts, the Archive Download Tool, and the Fire Map. Um, so this is the landing page on the MODAP side. Um, and you can hopefully um, see here, you've got these different icons. These will be on all of the pages. Um, here we are. This is um, just an example of a page. And I just wanted to point out a couple of things here. So here on the left-hand side, you have these icons. These will be on all of the MODAP pages. So you can easily switch between alerts, active fire data, et cetera. Um, we also have a feedback um, button on the top right. So if you want to, if something's not working or if you want to provide some feedback, this is the place to do that. Um, we also have a set of frequently asked questions. And I would strongly encourage you, if you're a firms user, to take a look at those. Um, I also wanted to point out the Active Fire user guide. These were written by the principal investigators who put together the algorithms. So they provide some really useful information. And um, again, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at them. OK, I'm now going to move to a live demonstration. Um, so Jennifer, if you could, um, thank you very much. Help me share my screen. All right, so here we go. Let me just make this large. OK, so we're going to start off. Um, perhaps if I go back to the landing page, here we are on the landing page. For mode apps, I'm going to first look at the active fire data. So I'm going to click on this active fire data symbol. This page was really set up to try and um, make it quick and easy for users to access the active fire data. So what we've done, as you can see, there are some regions. Um, we've set, set the regions up so that you don't have to download the whole of the um, world, um, but rather you can just download the area that you're interested in. And um, for the shape files and for the text files or comma-separated values, these data are made available as 24-hour, 48-hour, or 7-day files. Um, the 24-hour files are updated throughout the day. So every time a granule is processed, then data will be added to this. So these provide up-to-date information. Um, in addition to the shape files and text files, we have KML files. Um, so you can download these. Again, for the same region, 24 hour, 48 hour, or um, uh, there is also an animation. And I'm just going to show you one that I downloaded earlier. Um, so here we go. If I down open this one, ah, sorry, let me just open it properly. Open file. Okay, sorry. Let's just open this now. Yeah. Sorry 
practice. This didn't happen earlier when I did my practice demo. Okay, here we are. So here are the um, here are the um, fires in um, Google Earth. As you can see, you can zoom in, pan around. Um, often it looks like the um, whole of Central America here is on fire, but obviously as you zoom in, the fires get smaller. Um, if you click on one of the fires, then obviously there are two fires here. If you click on one, you will see some of the attributes. Um, so that gives you the lat and long of the fire, the date it was acquired, and the time, as well as the confidence value. Um, and this is the satellite from Aqua. And I will talk about the confidence value um, towards the end in the caveat, because I think that's quite important to discuss. OK. Um, next thing I wanted to show you was the web services. We do provide um, web services in terms of um, a web map service and a web map service with time support. Um, I'm not going to go through the web, map, the web services now. Um, if you have questions about these, we can take them offline. Um, but I wanted to move on to the demonstration on the email alerts. So here we are. Um, I just clicked here on the email alerts icon. I'm going to show you how to sign up for an email alert. Now I'll just type in my name, my email address, sorry. And um, these are all the alerts that I have already in place. This is quite useful because this allows you to manage your existing alerts. So for example, if you're going on leave and you don't want your inbox to be filled up with alerts, you can um, turn them off. So here you are, I've got one that's active. I can just um, decide to deactivate that alert if I'm going away and then switch it back on when I'm back again. Um, to create a new alert, because like me, you might have several, you have the option of um, giving it your own name. So here I'm just going to call it um, test. Um, you have the option of selecting a world, the world, a country, a custom region, or a protected area. So if you select the country, you will just select from a drop-down box. If you want a custom region, you will have the option of using the map or typing in coordinates. So you can draw a polygon of um, whichever shape you want to do um, and then save it. Or you can draw a classic custom box, um, which is this square box. Um, and you can also, um, sorry, one thing I want to show you, you can also um, zoom in to the area that you're interested in. Okay, here we are. I'm just going to look at West Africa. I'll save that. And then you have a number of options. So you can choose your data source. You can either select MODIS, VIRS, or MODIS and VIRS. If you're interested in getting fires from all the satellites, um, then obviously you would select both of them. Let me just reset the same level. You would select um, MODIS and VIRS. However, you will receive separate alerts. Um, so you also have the option of a so separate alerts, as in you'll have one for VIRS and one for, for MODIS. You have the option of choosing whether you want daily, weekly, or near real-time alerts. So if you want to be notified whenever a fire is detected in your area of interest, then you should select the rapid or near real-time alerts. Or obviously, you can choose a daily or weekly summary. If you um, choose the rapid alert, then any time a, um, a fire is detected in your area of interest, you'll be sent a notification. And in terms of the emails, you can have either a text only or text and map image. Um, you can vary the size of the map. We have some users that were in um, didn't want to have large emails, so obviously you can change the size of your map. And you can choose whether to have your alerts sent in English, Spanish, or French. And one final option is you can um, also have um, a CSV file attached. So the CSV file, sorry, CSV file or KML attachment. So there is one caveat here. If you choose a large area that's going to have a lot of fires, then the CSV file might uh, not be attached. So if the number of fires exceeds 90,000, we figured you can't possibly really need those in an email alert. So instead of the, an attachment, you will be sent um, a link to download the file instead. So if you're trying to build up a record of fires in a, an area for yourself and you want to get the, these um, alerts delivered with CSV files or KML files, then, then that's a really good way to go. Um, you will be sent a confirmation for your subscription if you select this box. Um, and yes, and of course, this is free of charge. Just point out here at the bottom, we have a Lance MODIS mailing list. 
which will provide notification of any data outages or scheduled maintenance which may affect you your um, may affect the near real time data coming in and um, a firm's mailing list where we can notify you of any changes that we're making. Okay, and I just wanted to show you an example of what a fire alert looks like. So here is one um, for Australia that, um, that I received uh, earlier today. So you can see there's a map. Um, I selected the whole of Australia for this alert. Um, all of the fires are shown in red. This is, um, yes, uh, sorry. So this is from the MODIS collection six. Um, and you can see the time that the email was generated. And uh, at the bottom of the email, sorry, you've also got some links to take you back to the NASA firm's homepage, or if you want to view or delete your subscription. Okay, um, the next thing that I wanted to show you is the um, download tool. So um, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, sorry, is that here on the um, text files, as I said, you have these quick links for 24 hours, uh, 48 hours or seven days. We do also keep two months worth of these text files or CSV files on a server. Currently, this is an FTP server. Um, however, NASA has mandated that we're um, going to move everything to HTTPS. So this will change over the next few weeks, um, but we will provide um, notification and instructions on how to do that. For the FTP, or also for um, the HTTPS when it's available, you will be asked to um, register in Earth Data. So Earth Data login, if you haven't done it already, it's free of charge. It's a one-off, and it can be um, your ask for your username, password, and a few um, few bits of information about who you work for. Um, and it can be used across any of the EDSYS um, data sites. Okay. All right. So moving on to the um, download tool, this is another way to get data older than seven days. So you can put in a request um, to download the data. You can choose to have it as a shape file, a comma separated file, um, or a JSON file. Um, and you will be sent an email when your request is made available, or when it's available and you can download it. Okay, so I'm just going to show you briefly. It's very similar to the email alert, um, except you can't. Um, so here we are. I'm just going to select. Oh, here you can also select um, to have data for a protected area. So in this example, I'm going to choose a protected area. I'll choose um, a protected area in Algeria. Here we are if I select that. Again, you can select your fire data source as before. Um, you can have. You can choose any dates that you like. Um, you can go right back to the beginning. If you choose a large area um, and it returns too many fire requests, you will be uh, given a warning message to say that you either need to choose a, a smaller time range or a smaller geographic area. But um, you can still download the data. Okay, here we are. I've selected a shape file, but obviously you've got um, options for a CSV or JSON file. And then you type in your email address. Um, once you have... Um, I just go back here. Once you've been sent a notification, you can also check to see whether your request is available. You can check your request status here by typing in your email address. So um, here we are. This one has not yet been processed at the top. Um, and here is one that I can download. What I did want to mention here is that when you download the data, here's one I prepared earlier, um, you will be sent um, a zip file. And when you open it, your data will be in two different files. So you've got the file, in this case, you've got a fire, fire, fire archive file and a fire NRT file. So what I want to point out is that your data will be separated. So if, you, if your data request returned all the data and the near real-time data, it will be sent in two separate files. This is not designed to make life awkward for you, although it may, because you may have to um, merge the two files to put into your GIS system. But we did that um, because people were confusing the near real time and the standard quality data. So we just wanted to make it very clear um, the difference, that there is a difference between those two data sets. OK, um, moving on, I wanted to show you the fire map. Um, this used to be called Web Fire Mapper. Um, the way that it's been set up now, um, we have a, new, a few new features. 
Um, one that we're very pleased to finally have in is to have in the um, corrected reflectance imagery from Beers and from MODIS. So you can see here we've got um, various, we've got MODIS Terra, True Color, and 71 for Aqua and um, Terra, and also we have the equivalent bands, uh, equivalent band combinations for Beers. Okay, so if we turn that on, um, this will show you today's imagery, so you can see it's not yet complete. If I go to yesterday, you'll see, and um, there we are, there's the, the full set of imagery. And what's great about having this available in firms now is um, it gives you a, a better indication of fires that you might have missed due to heavy cloud or smoke, or also in the case of um, MODIS, because of the way that the um, polar orbiting works and the swath width, there are sometimes gaps at the equator. Um, so this enables you to see whether or not you may have missed a fire due to um, a gap. OK, I'm just going to turn that off for a moment and uh, zoom right in. I just want to show you that here it looks like the whole of northern India is on fire. Um, but hopefully you can see that as we zoom in, the fire pixels become smaller. And if we zoom right in, you can hopefully see that there's a difference between the um, modus fire pixels and the veers. So the veers um, are 375 meter, and when you zoom right in, they should straight they treat their size, and uh, the modus are one kilometer pixels, so um, slightly larger. Um, one of the new features that we've added is um, just a color coding. So if you want to make a particular data set stand out, you can color code it. So here we are, we can put all the veers, um, daytime fires in purple. Um, you can also switch off daytime and nighttime, um, depending on what you're most interested in. Obviously, you can turn off so that you're just displaying data from one instrument. Um, on the quick view, you get the option of um, today, the last 24 hours, last 48 hours, 72 hours, and seven days. If you go to the advanced tool, you can select data for up to a month. I know in the old web fire mapper, you could select for longer. We're looking into options for doing that again. But what we've got now, which I think is really nice, is we have this um, gridded um, capability. And um, what I think is particularly nice about this is if you look at data for um, a longer period, it just makes it much quicker in terms of response. And it also acts sort of as a heat map, so you can see where most fires have occurred. So you can see here in northern Australia, we've had a lot of fires. Same too in northern India, and um, again in West Africa. So I think that's a really nice feature. There's an auto switch, which will select the best for you. So if it thinks that the number of fires returned um, would be much quicker displayed in a grid, then it will do that. But you can actually turn that off and um, make it go to points. But it will take longer to display. And looking at this, it doesn't look quite as meaningful. OK. Um, so I should have just said that the imagery that we have comes from the Global Imagery Browse Services. Um, these are the same images that are available in Worldview um, and also available through Gibbs. And I will talk, as I said, I'll talk more about Worldview towards the end. Um, another couple of features are that we now have um, a shareable link. Um, this isn't through an icon, just through the URL at the top. So if I select and copy that, and then go to a new browser and paste that, paste and go, then it will bring up the same extent, which is, which is very useful. OK. One thing that we have um, coming, um, which isn't available yet, is the, an FRP value. So this is currently on our development server, which is Firms 2, that will be transitioned over the next couple of weeks to the main firm um, fire map. And um, what we've got here is we have a checkbox which will allow you to put on the FRP value. So the FRP value is the fire radiative power. It's a measure of the radiant heat output from a fire. And um, it has been demonstrated by Martin Worcester and co that um, FRP is related to the rate at which fuel is consumed. So if that's something you're interested in, um, then this will be a very nice feature for you. Um, what I should say is that um, the FRP is um, it, it's a transient value. It's, it's what the fire was, was at the time of satellite overpass. So obviously, a fire could have been, could have been at the beginning or at the end of its life cycle, and so it could have been cooler or cooler than 
then it got later on if you see what I mean. So after the satellite over past negative five got bigger. So it needs to be treated with caution, but a lot number of our users have found it to be very useful. Okay. Um, so that's something that's coming soon. We will also have some shareable links and um, some icons via social media. Okay, Jennifer mentioned that you can see the firm's data in um, Worldview, and um, that's something that I just wanted to, to demonstrate now. Um, so here we are. Um, I would encourage you to take the tour of Worldview if you haven't seen it already. Um, if you want to add, here we are. These, this is the image from today, so I'm just going to move it back to yesterday's image so that you can see the full, uh, see the whole world. And I'm going to add in the fire data. So um, there are over 600 layers, imagery layers now in Worldview. So they are divided by um, hazards and disasters. So if you're interested in fires, um, here we are. You can select the fires and thermal anomalies. This is from um, MODIS, Terra, MODIS Aqua, Insumi, MPP, day and night. And there we are. So these are the same fires that you will be um, seeing in Worldview. So what's really nice about um, Worldview is that you have various options. One is to create a shareable link. Um, this can be a bit.ly link, which is nice and short. So you can copy and paste that and share it through the social media or um, just uh, share it with a colleague. Another really nice thing is that you can create your own geotiff. So if you see an area that you're interested in, you can go to this snapshot tool in the top right-hand corner and you can select um, an area of interest. I mentioned that the MODIS subsets are going away. This is one of the replacements for that. You can create your own snapshot of any area. You have the option of selecting your resolution. Um, here I'm going to download it as a 250 meter um, geotiff, but you also have the option of a J JPEG, PNG, or KMZ file. Um, and you also have options of downloading a world file. And then you can download um, that, um, and that, that's your snapshot. And then you can pull that into your GIS um, if, if, if you want to. OK. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show you in Worldview is that you can also do an animation. So I have one set up. I have, I've zoomed here to the St. Thomas fire. Let's just cancel that. The St. Thomas fire, which took place in Santa Barbara, California, um, around the, started around the 4th of December. If I go back to, sorry, it started on the 5th of December. If I go back to the 4th, you can see there are, the fire hasn't really got going there. And by the 5th of December, huge fire has started. And um, what you can do is you can scroll through using this timeline um, in Worldview. But you can also create your own animated GIF if that's something that you're interested in. So here we are. I'm going to put in the dates for December the 4th through to December the 12th. And um, this sometimes takes a little while to, to load. But it um, gives you an animation of the fires through those days. And you also have the option of downloading it. Um, here we are. You can see as it scrolls through. And if you want to create your own animated GIF to download, there we are again. You have the box that you can adjust the size and the resolution, and um, I think that's a very useful tool. Um, the other thing, if I just go out of this, uh, the other thing you can do in um, Worldview is if you're interested in air quality, there are a number of other layers that you can add in, such as aerosol optical depth, um, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide. So various layers that you can, you can add in um, as overlays. So a very useful tool. OK, I think that's it for my demonstration. Jennifer, if, you would, um, if we can go back to the slides, that would be great. OK, I can't see the slides. Come on. Can you see them now? No, I can't. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, um, Jennifer, if you don't mind just scrolling through them. Um, no problem. I'll save some time. OK, so the first slide um, is just the URL for Earth Data, uh, for, sorry, for Worldview. So that's the URL you'd go to. Um, just wanted to make sure you have that. And then moving on to slide two, I just wanted to talk about some of the caveats that I think you should consider when using the data from firms. I talked a lot about 
the difference. I've talked a lot about near real time and standard quality fire data. So I just wanted to talk about the difference between them. And the key difference is geolocation. In terms of the actual algorithm, it's the same as the standard quality algorithm. Um, near real time fire products are expedited. And to facilitate this, they use predicted geolocation. Um, for MODIS, the difference between near real time and standard geolocation for fire hotspots is routinely less than 100 meters. And for VIAs, it's even less than this. There's virtually no difference. However, there are situations, particularly before and after spacecraft maneuvers and during space weather events, when the difference can increase up to several kilometers. So the recommendation from EOSIS is always to use the standard data as it becomes available. And in firm, we get this data quality checked from the University of Maryland Fire Science Computing Facility, generally with a two to three month lag. So it may well be that you have to use near real time data for a while, but as soon as the standard quality data comes available, we do encourage you to use that. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, another question that we get asked is how appropriate is the hotspot or fire locations? Um, how appropriate are they for my research? Well, the MODIS and VIAS fire locations are good for the following. Determining the location of active fires, providing information on the spatial and temporal distribution of fires, and comparing data between years. What they don't do is they don't provide information on cloud cover or missing data. And it is possible sometimes to derive misleading or even incorrect results by ignoring the other types of pixel. So in some cases, it might be more appropriate to use one of the level three um, products such as the climate modeling grid. Um, so that the climate modeling grid is um, statist their statistical summaries of fire pixels intended for regional and global monitoring. OK, so I put together this um, here, uh, just a few questions. What data should I use? OK, so if I want to know um, as soon as a fire is detected in my area of interest, then your options, good options would be the firm's near real time alert, the firm's fire map, or the 24 hour CSV shape or KML files. If you want to compare fires between years, then we'd recommend that you use the standard data, that's the MCD 14 ML, as opposed to DL at the end of it. And these are available from the, um, sorry, this is the MODIS. These are available from the firm download archive or from the University of Maryland website. The VIA's standard data are also available from the firm's download archive. If you want to publish, uh, do research and publish your findings, then standard data is what you should use. It's not advised that you use near real time data for science publications. And if you're doing regional or global modeling, we recommend that you use the climate modeling grid products from the University of Maryland. And there's a web link there for that. Um, as I say, these provide gridded statistical summaries of fire pixel information intended for regional and global modeling. OK, um, next slide. Uh, nearly there. <laughs> Um, we often get asked about the confidence. If you look at the attribute file, so oh, one thing I forgot to show you, um, in FireMap at the bottom, there is a um, identify tool. If you use that, if you click on the fires, it will provide you a with a list of the attributes for that particular fire. So it will, it will include, it's a bit like in the KML, it will provide the lap long, time of acquisition, um, it will provide FRP and confidence value, amongst a couple of other things. And users often ask us what the confidence value is. Well, it was set, it was designed to help users gauge the quality of individual fire pixels. Um, and the note is that it should be used with caution. It's likely that it will vary in meaning in different parts of the world. Nevertheless, some of the users have found it very useful um, in excluding false positive occurrences of fire, which I should note are pretty rare. Um, for MODIS, unfortunately, um, the values are different between MODIS and VIAs. Um, I think this is due to the fact that different PIs developed the algorithms. So for MODIS, the values range between 0 and 100% and can be used to assign three fire classes, low, nominal, or high confidence. And for VIAs, they are actually set to low, nominal, and high. So um, I won't go into um, what they mean, uh, that's here on the slides. If you want to find out more, you can, you can read it. So just to say that the confidence value is application specific. Unfortunately, there's no optimal cutoff. Um, you just have to work out which threshold is best for you uh, for your particular area. 
Uh, next slide. Um, we also get asked if we can use, if, you, if a user can use active fire to map burnt areas. Um, it's not recommended to do this um, due to the spatial and temporal sampling issues. For some applications, you could get an acceptable accuracy, although the effective burnt area per pixel is not a simple constant. And um, as um, the instrument only detects active fires as they're burning, it may miss um, fires that are burning between satellite overpasses, and so you might get an incomplete picture of the area that's burned. There is a MODIS burnt area product available, and uh, this link here will point you to that. A VIA's burnt area product is coming, um, but it is some way off yet, and we don't have a, we don't have a deadline for that yet. Um, and finally, I just wanted to repeat that um, for the most current information, we would advise you to use the Active Fire user guide. Um, you can get those at this link here. Um, and I would also encourage you to look at the frequently asked questions, which has other caveats that you might want to consider. Um, and finally, thank you for listening. Over to you, Jennifer. Okay, thank you, Diane. Thanks, everybody. So what we'll do now is we'll move along to a final set of polling questions. Um, and not to worry if you asked a question, they have been captured. So we'll give these about uh, three or four minutes or so, and then from there we'll move directly to the Q&A uh, period. So if you think of something, feel free to enter those in, and I will um, read the questions aloud, and Diane will answer the questions for you. So thank you so much for your feedback here, and uh, we'll give this just about three minutes or so. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay, everybody, we're going to give this another minute or so, and um, certainly after the webinar is complete, I usually leave, leave the virtual meeting space open for a few minutes, so if you think of something after the Q&A is over or any additional comments, you can feel free to enter those into the Q&A. So in another uh, minute or so, we'll move directly to the Q&A period. All right, thanks, everybody. Okay, everybody, this is incredibly useful feedback here. Thank you so much. At this point, we are going to move along to the Q&A period. And I did capture um, a question earlier on, but before I get to those, I wanted to let you know that today's agenda, along with all of today's uh, slides, can be found in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. If you highlight any of those files, you'll be prompted with an option to download the file. That's a persistent feature. If you listen to the webinar at a later point in time, you will still be able to download today's presentation file. And then the extra 1A slides that are listed below, 
include tips and highlight some of these steps that were presented today during the live demonstration so that you might find a value as well. And so with that, let me go ahead and pull up today's first question here. If you could give me just one moment here. Okay, so the first question was, I'm curious to know if the GO16 data are in your development plans. Diane? Um, thank you. Um, David, great question. I know a lot of people are really interested in the GO16 data. We would very much like to include them into firms. Um, we are waiting on um, a decision from the Lance User Working Group as to whether or not we can include these in the future. My understanding is that the algorithm is not quite as robust as it could be yet. Um, there's still some work to be done on it. So we are waiting um, partly for that and um, partly from the OK from the UWG, but it's certainly something that will be considered. OK, wonderful. Thank you, Diane. The next uh, question is, uh, before I could see with Google Earth the updated hotspots using the KML layer, is there now some option to be able to visualize them in the same way? Um, so the automated KML file, the automated update one, we haven't had that running for a while. Um, but if it's something that you're interested in, we can um, we can reconsider um, setting that up. Currently, if you want to view the data in, K in the KML, you have to download the data the last 24 hours or 48 hours. Okay, great. Thank you, Diane. Okay, so we've got, excuse me, one, one second here. Okay, so the next question is, uh, greetings from Oregon in the U.S. What is the smallest area that can be selected for fire notification? Um, so it's not an entirely easy answer for that one. Um, the smallest fires from um, MODIS, um, I think we said it was 50 meters squared, but that assumes that it's a hot fire, the satellite is directly overhead, and there's no smoke or clouds obscuring the fire detection. So to some extent that varies. Um, I'm not sure that we have an answer for that on our VIRS frequently asked questions, so I will um, make sure that we do have that. Um, but that's the answer. It can be 50 meters squared, um, but it does depend on ideal conditions. And um, if a fire is burning under a story, um, under a canopy, or if there's heavy smoke, then um, those smaller fires will not be detected. Okay, thank you, Diane. Uh, the next question is, do we know how much of the false positive rate in, in firm's data? Is any ground data available if I want to evaluate that in the CONUS area? Um, well, I would recommend that you um, contact the PI for that. We'll have a, I can perhaps, perhaps um, Jennifer, I could uh, contact um, this user offline um, just to see what yeah. papers are available. So some, um, so uh, it's a very good question. In terms of validation, all the products have been validated. So for MODIS, they were valid initially they were validated using the AFTA instrument, which was on the Terra satellite. So it was great because we had coincident high-resolution data with the MODIS data, and we were able to validate the fires, um, validate the MODIS fires on Terra. For VIRS, we haven't had that luxury, um, but because the MODIS data has been validated on Aqua, the VIRS data has been validated against that. Um, in terms of CONUS. Specifically, I couldn't really answer that off the top of my head, but hopefully I can help find somebody that could. Um, I know the US Forest Service has done an awful lot in CONUS, and they would probably be very good people to contact, and I can certainly put you in touch with them. Yes, and just to add to that, for any questions that are not uh, answered in full during the Q&A session, Diane will have uh, your email information and can certainly follow up after the webinar offline. All right, so moving on to the next question, we do have quite a few. Is the near real-time data within three hours of acquisition? So <clears throat> Lance has a three-hour cutoff, um, so all the data should be available within three hours. For VIRS, the, um, for, for, for Terra, it's usually under two hours. For Aqua, it's slightly more than that. For VIRS, it's very close to three hours. So in terms of processing it in firms, we probably add on another 20 minutes for that. 
So it should be. We have had issues in the past with some of the email alerts. Because we have so many email alert subscriptions, um, it sometimes has slowed the data getting out to people. But we have made some improvements on the back end, and that should be a lot better now. So you should be seeing the data in, in or under three hours from observation. OK, thank you, Diane. And one of our participants has provided a link with respect to a question about smoke data. Um, so there is a NOAA link there for everybody um, to take a look at. And then moving on to our next question, when we download the active fire data, it presents the fire as points rather than hot spots. Does each point represent one kilometer squared pixel? Yeah, well, for MODIS, it represents a one kilometer squared pixel. So the point that you get is the center of that one kilometer square pixel for MODIS. And for VIAS, it's the center of that 375 meter pixel. OK, thank you, Diane. And moving on to our next question. Um, in the email alerts, could we receive shape files rather than CSV? Uh, the answer to that is yes. So what you would need to do is um, go in and manage your subscription um, and change that to shapefile rather than CSV. It may be that you end up deleting and resubmitting your um, request for that particular email alert, but yes, you can. You can have either a CSV, a shapefile, or a KML attachment for your email alert. OK, great. And then there is a uh, follow-up uh, comment regarding the um, potential for GOES-16 data. And the comment is that uh, this, the GOES-16 data may also be used for generating better animation in the current firm's system. Right, yes. And um, that's something that the next group at NASA Ames are, are looking at. Um, they will be looking at processing GOES-16 data. Um, and other groups are, will also be processing the fire data from GOES-16. So um, NOAA is obviously producing it, um, and the, I think um, I'm trying to think where else is. I think there's a group in uh, King's College London that are producing it. So so people are producing that data, and yes, I mean in terms of it's um, for those of you that aren't familiar with GOES, R, it's a geo or GOES 16. It's a geostationary satellite, um, so it provides constant um, imaging of a particular part of the Earth's surface. So it will provide much more regular updates of active fires. Um, but the spatial resolution um, won't be quite as good as um, as VIAs. But, uh, but that will definitely help those that are doing strategic fire management. OK, thank you, Diane. The next question is, how can we learn more about the algorithm? Is that in the frequently asked questions? There is some information in the frequently asked questions, but there are also links in the frequently asked questions to papers that have been written by the principal investigators. So that will provide you with the background that you need on the algorithm. And again, you know, if you can't find it, then please contact me and I can send you those papers directly. OK, great. Um, and I just wanted to add that if you, uh, you know, do not recall Diane's uh, email address after the fact. Um, you can always send an email to support at earthdata.nasa.gov, and that question will be forwarded along to Diane or someone from her team. And then moving on to the next question, can VIRS replace MODIS as it has the same coverage and better resolution? Um, certainly, uh, there would be a good argument for replacing uh, MODIS Aqua um, for the VIAs because it's the same overpass time. Um, but MODIS Terra still provides a morning overpass, so it provides another look, um, which you wouldn't have if you excluded all of the MODIS data. So I suppose if you didn't want to use um, data from three instruments, you might want to just use MODIS Terra as the morning overpass and then perhaps VIAs um, for the afternoon overpass. OK, thank you, Diane. And just a minute or so here, we'll, we'll be moving into the extended Q&A period, which will have a hard cutoff of uh, 3.15 PM. So if any of the questions are not answered, um, surely we'll be able to get to those offline via email. 
um, I've just added the support at earthdata.nasa.gov or diane.k.davies. I believe that's correct, right, Diane, at nasa.gov? Okay, yeah. wonderful. And then because we do have quite a few uh, additional questions, let's move on to the next. Uh, the next question is a combined comment with question. The 48-hour link to Central and North Africa is the same as the 24-hour link. I think the URL needs to be edited. My question is regarding using the KML files in Google Earth as a network KML. If I put this URL into Google Earth, it doesn't load. But if I save the KML and upload it to my own web server, I can view it as a network KML from there. Mm -hmm. Any idea why this is? And if you need me to repeat, I'd be happy to do so. Um, well, obviously, uh, the, thank you for your first comment. Um, obviously, we've spotted something that we've missed, so we will update that um, error so that the 48-hour link is, is not the same as 24-hour link. Um, with regards to the question on the KML, I don't know the answer. Um, I don't know if one of my colleagues um, that's on the line does. If so, please speak up. Otherwise, that's a question that I will, I will have to look at and get back to you on. Um, okay, thank, thank you, Diane. Um, let's see here. Uh, there's actually another question from the next group at NASA Ames, and uh, the question is, uh, we, the next group at NASA Ames Research Center, are generating near real-time TOA images from GOES-16. Can that data be ingested into firms? Um, we are governed by the LANCE user working group, um, so we would have to um, see what they said. Um, in terms of LANCE, we try to make sure that all of the algorithms that we use are fully supported. And by that, I mean um, they're generally um, considered to be standard algorithms, and they have support in terms of quality. So if there's any degradation on the instrument, we have science backup to say how that impacts the algorithm and somebody that can answer the questions uh, for the end user. So we wouldn't just take um, any data. It would have to be. Um, approved by the user working group. So um, I have no doubt that um, such data would be incredibly useful to a large number of people. And um, I know um, that that's certainly something that will be considered in the future. Um, but at, currently, we don't have any plans to, to implement that. OK, thank you, Diane. And the next question is, is there a plan to put more satellites in, into space to make it quicker and help map out the fires? <laughs> um, good question. Um, it's above my pay grade. Um, there are um, there are all kinds of proposals to put in small sats and cube sats, various things. And I know that NASA will be looking at various options. Um, but currently, um, I can't I can't say that there's anything specific. Um, J1 JPSS1 was launched last year, and data from that hopefully will come online shortly. And, um, and following that, there will be JPSS2. Um, but other than that, I'm, and, and obviously, the, the geostationary satellites, um, they potentially are a great source of information for more frequent uh, fire observations. So watch this space. OK, great. Thank you. All right, and then let's see here. Uh, let's see. Is there a plan to help? Is there a plan to help pinpoint peat fires better? No. Peat. Oh, well, that's a good question. No, we don't. I mean, we can't distinguish between fire types. So we can't distinguish between a peat fire and a forest fire, per se. Although one thing that we have been talking about putting in is a, a good land cover map, um, which might help you identify some fires on peat areas if they have been mapped correctly. Um, but other than that, uh, no. Sorry. OK, thank you, Diane. And let's see here, we do. OK, the question is, um, and welcome from Argentina. My question is, the layer of Google Earth MODIS hotspots updated automatically, and now it does not. What is the problem? OK, that's something I'm going to have to look at and get back to you on. So um, yes, we will. I've taken a note, and I will look at that. Okay. Thank you, Diane. 
Um, let's see here. Moving on, I just I need to scroll down a bit and see what we have uh, near real time. Yes, yes, it is near real time data. Um, let's see. Just moving down to see if there yes there are. Okay, so the next question is I don't believe I've missed any. Um, uh, my question is, if you are thinking of having alerts with a pixel size less than 375 meters, since in the case of Peru, 75% of the forest loss is less than 5 hectares. Mm. Yes, I'm afraid we are constrained by the um, global observation. And 375 meters is the highest resolution that we can get from these global satellites. Um, I mean, if you use something like Landsat, you could get um, an increased spatial resolution, but obviously it doesn't have the same repeat frequency, um, so you wouldn't get um, you wouldn't get um, fires every day. You would just get them every eight, sixteen days if you use um, sixteen days or eight days if you use both of the Landsat satellites, and then you'd have to process them yourself, most likely. Um, so. I'm sorry that we don't really have a good answer for you. OK, thanks, Diane. And I'm just looking here to see whether or not there are additional questions. If you have a question, please feel free to um, you know, type that into the Q&A pod. Again, the presentation files from today are located in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Um, you can feel free to, I did place uh, Diane's email information into the Q&A pod, but certainly if you have a question and you, you, know, you forgot to take that information down, um, you can certainly feel free to email me with the email address on your webinar you know, registration or the approval message, and I will be sure to forward that along to Diane and her team. Um, and what we'll do today, it depends if there are no further questions, what we'll do is we'll leave the virtual meeting space open an additional 10 minutes or so for those of you who might be interested in downloading the presentation files. Um, but we would log off from the audio component. Um, so let's see here. I don't see any further questions. OK, here we go. OK, so a follow-up question. Uh, to the size, how small of a polygon can be subscribed to? Diane, are you there? So the next yes, question. Yes, sorry, is, sorry, I muted. Um, I did hear the question. Um, okay, what's good. the smallest size of polygon that can be subscribed to? I'm presuming that you're talking about for uh, you're talking about the email alerts um, for this question. And that's, um, I mean, I guess you could choose a really small area, but um, uh, as small as you like, I guess. I mean, we have people that select for small protected areas. Um, yeah, I guess you just won't get very many alerts if you choose a very small area. And I don't know a minimum size. I'm sorry, I haven't looked. But I could get back to you on that if you need to know. OK, very good. Are there any additional questions? Thanks to all of you who've, uh, you know, you've stuck around for the extended Q&A period today. Um, we actually will have a webinar uh, the, the last week of June that will focus on a new uh, Landsat product. So that is um, also now available through our NASA Earth Data Search tool. So it will be a joint NASA Land Processes DAC webinar and uh, the USGS reps from the Landsat team will be doing that. So stay tuned to the tinyurl.com Earth Data webinar for information on that. And um, let's see, we'll give it another minute or so. If there are no additional questions, what we'll do is we will log off from the audio component, but I will leave the virtual meeting space open. If you think of something, feel free to type it in there, and I will ensure that um, you know Diane receives the Q&A log so she will able to follow up offline for any of those questions that were not answered in full here today. All right. Let's see, I'm going to scroll down and make sure. Thank you very much for the um, 
I'm glad that people found this webinar valuable. We are happy that you were able to join us today. We had participation from over 100 countries, so that is really good news. And um, hopefully we will see you at an upcoming webinar. And with that, I would like to thank our speaker today, Diane Davies, um, for, for the content and for the presentation, and thanks to all of you. With that, we will log off from the audio component. And Diane, if you could just stay in the virtual meeting space in case there's a question that we could um, answer within the Q&A pod, that would be great for another 10 minutes or so. Sure, no problem. Thanks, Jennifer. You're quite welcome. All right, thank you, everybody. At this point, we'll log off from the audio component and uh, hope to see you at an upcoming webinar. All right, take care, everybody. All right, goodbye now.